You see, I got this. Now let me get this straight. You say it's all wrong, right? I'm trapped in space and slowly running out of energy. And you're trapped on Earth and slowly running out of energy. Thanks, Houston. That makes me feel a lot better. Spaceship Earth is our biosphere. We can imagine it to be comprised of smaller ecosystems, such as forests and deserts. It's interesting to isolate an ecosystem as if it were closed to outside energy. An isolated island teeming with a vast diversity of life forms, many still waiting to be discovered together with their physical surroundings. The concept of a closed ecosystem helps us to understand how entropy increases, threatening all life. Matter slowly becomes disordered. Energy becomes scattered and unavailable. So everywhere life depends on energy from outside the ecosystem to reverse this entropy. A most important part of this outside energy is sunlight trapped by photosynthesis in the leaves of plants. Photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplasts of plant cells. Here, carbon dioxide and water, in the presence of chlorophyll, are converted into energy storage molecules, like sugar. This process is still only partly understood, but seems to involve two complex reaction sequences. First, a light reaction charges up energy carrier molecules. Second, a reaction independent of light, the dark reaction, stores this energy in sugar and starch molecules. These two reaction sequences form a foundation for energy flow on Earth. They transport energy into virtually every ecosystem, no matter how small or how large. The biotic or living components of the ecosystem are fueled by this energy. Some of the energy becomes trapped and recycles through the system. And some is lost. This energy input also brings non-living or abiotic materials into the system. Energy flow within living organisms allows them to modify abiotic components such as water, minerals, and carbon dioxide. Some of this abiotic material remains trapped, recycling within the ecosystem, while other abiotic components are carried away. Scientific research seeks how the individual contributes to this energy flow within an ecosystem, both as part of a population of similar individuals and within the community of all life forms in the ecosystem. Individuals receive most of their energy through food. So in every ecosystem, the most important mechanisms of energy flow are food chains. Producers are the first link in every chain. They're almost always green plants which trap sunlight energy. The primary consumer in the food chain is a herbivore, often, but by no means always, an animal. Secondary consumers are carnivores, usually, but not always animals. The food chain may stretch to tertiary consumers, and occasionally quaternary consumers. A steady supply of body wastes and dead organisms add scavengers to the food chain and decomposers. Food chains link groups of organisms into complex networks called food webs. The energy flow through these food webs links the success of both individuals and entire populations to the success of other species. Naturally, we are particularly concerned about the success of the human population in every ecosystem. But because of the interconnections of the food web, a changing population of any species
can threaten many other organisms. What population of humans can an ecosystem support? And how many other species? The concept of trophic levels helps us find answers. The trophic level consists of those organisms which compete for the same energy source. Grass and weeds both compete for sunlight. So they're on the same trophic level along with all other plants. A great many primary consumers compete for energy from this first trophic level. Together, these primary consumers make up the second trophic level. In comparison, relatively few species harvest their energy from grasshoppers, snails, and cows. This pyramid shape is not just a pretty design. It is a graph of biomass, the total mass of all organisms occupying each trophic level. Biomass always decreases as the trophic level increases. But why? Let's look at the energy trapped from sunlight by the first trophic level, the plant level. Only a fraction of the sunlight energy that reaches Earth ever gets to a plant. Some is absorbed by bare ground. Other energy is reflected from water, clouds, and from the plants themselves. Of the energy that actually reaches the plants, a portion fuels the process of photosynthesis. Still more food energy is required for plant metabolism. This is lost as heat. Only a small fraction is converted to plant tissue. In other words, stored energy. Now look at how plant energy is converted to the next trophic level, those organisms which prey on plants. Of the total energy available in the plants, about half is never even consumed. The energy of the unconsumed half does not transfer to the next trophic level. In turn, nearly half of the remaining food energy is not digested. It passes from the body as wastes. Of the energy which is digested, a large part is dissipated as waste heat, the byproduct of metabolism. Of the original plant-stored energy, only a very small fraction, about 10%, is transferred to the new tissue. In other words, successfully captured by the next trophic level. In turn, only about 10% of this energy is successfully captured by the succeeding trophic level and converted to tissue. Apply these figures to the plight of a stranded astronaut who wants to get the most energy out of corn and chicken. When corn energy is moved up a single trophic level to a chicken, as little as 10% of the corn energy may be passed on. That's 90% lost before it even reaches the astronaut's mouth. These figures reflect dramatically on the enthusiasm in our society for eating meat. Meat may be tasty, but it represents an enormous drain in the energy flow. Just imagine how many more mouths could be fed worldwide by eliminating an entire trophic level to produce a more efficient energy flow.